My husband has died and I have no son. They say that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to then become my husband. This was a snippet from a letter that was written by Tutankhamun's widow. If you remember from our episode last week on Mystery Monday, King Tutankhamun died in 1325 at the age of 18, leaving no heir. Yes, he and his wife had had two children, but neither one of them survived. This, of course, left King Tutankhamun's widow in a very precarious position. And so in an act of emergency, she wrote a letter to the king of the Hittites, which is now modern day Turkey, asking to marry one of his sons so that she might remain safe. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Also, again, thank you so much to Tiffany Monroe, our producer. Tiffany is a Reiki master and teacher here in Atlanta. We are working on a very special episode with Tiffany coming up around what Reiki is, because I know I've had a lot of people asking me about that. But if you would like to get in touch with Tiffany yourself and arrange an appointment with her, even if you live elsewhere in the world, something can be arranged. Just shoot her an email. Her email is listed down below. Also, thank you again to all of our Patreons. Because of you, you make our lives so much easier here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to help our channel out, you can follow the link below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are gonna be talking about the unknown man E, AKA the mystery mummy, AKA the anti-mummy. in Cairo, Egypt, there lies an unidentified dead body. No, it's not like a CSI, a dead body of a murder scene. In fact, this body is thousands of years old. However, this body was mummified in a very peculiar way and was left with a bunch of royalty. The only problem is we have no name and no idea who this person actually was. The tomb of this mummy was found in 1871 in the Valley of the Kings, as we spoke about last week. Now, the person who originally discovered this tomb was not an archaeologist or an Egyptologist. He was an average, everyday goat herder. And for 10 years, this goat herder, along with his brothers, used this tomb as their personal bank account. They would go and rob the tomb and take out all the gold and then sell it for money. I can't say I don't blame them. I mean, desperate times do call for desperate measures. But by 1881, they were found out and they led authorities to the tomb in return for a lesser sentence. Now, the Egyptologist working on this case had the tomb immediately excavated. Now, we talked about this again in our last Mystery Monday episode regarding Howard Carter. You see, they needed to or should have tracked everything within the tomb. They would usually take an artist and have an artist draw everything so they knew where everything was located in the tomb once they got it out into the museum or into a lab. But with this particular tomb, the archaeologist in charge was so paranoid about other tomb raiders coming around and raiding the tomb that he had this tomb excavated within 48 hours, taking no notes or having no artist there to sketch where everything was. This, of course, did not make it any easier for us to identify, even today in 2020, who this mystery mummy could be. Now, this mystery mummy was not the only mummy in this tomb. In fact, there were other mummies, more famous pharaoh mummies, along with this dude. These mummies included Ramses II and Ramses III, 
along with Tot Moses III. Now, all of these pharaohs were pretty famous in their own right. A lot of them great rulers and great warriors. And to be honest, a lot of these pharaohs had gone missing. It seems that these pharaohs had originally been placed in other tombs but had been moved into this tomb that was found in 1871 sometime along our historical timeline. So needless to say, it was pretty exciting for the archaeologists and Egyptologists to finally find these missing pharaohs. Again, the only problem was, who the hell was the other guy? You see, for Egyptians, they plastered their names on everything. It was part of their ritual of death, of knowing who they were, having an identity in the afterlife. So for this mummy to have no name really was strange. By 1886, the first archaeologists and doctors started to unravel this mysterious mummy. This mysterious mummy was important enough to have been buried with royals, but yet his mummification was unlike any other mummification they had ever seen. For starters, most of the mummies have very peaceful and tranquil looks on their faces in death, but this mummy has one of the most horrific facial expressions you will ever see. There's nothing on his body to indicate that he was murdered. However, the look on, on his face tells a totally different story. When a mummy becomes mummified, or when the Egyptian priest would go to mummify a person, they did everything they could to keep the person's body intact. You see, the ancient Egyptians believed that the body they had in this life, they would need to carry over to the next life. And so when they went to go mummify a person, first they would remove the brain through the nose. This was to try to keep the skull intact. Then on the left side of the stomach, they would place an incision to remove all the organs. The only organ they typically left was the heart. After this, they would stuff the body with herbs to keep the body's shape. For 35 days, they would use salt, placing salt all over the body to dry the body of fluids. After this, they would famously then wrap the body up with very expensive linens. At this point, they would invoke a sense of magic. They would wrap amulets and they would place certain spells around the body itself. They would also release incantations or prayers to their gods. Within the tomb itself, there would be almost a cheat sheet of directions for the person to rise up out of the dead and make his or her way into the afterlife. Well, none of our mysterious mummy had any of these ambulance. He had none of the magic. It was almost like he was screwed once he was to arise from his tomb with no way to get to the afterlife. The Egyptians took this process so seriously that they even had animals mummified so that animals could make their way to the afterlife as well. I'm a huge animal lover and you best believe that I will be pissed if any of my beautiful dogs from the past aren't waiting for me on the other side when my day comes. But you see, it wasn't just the missing amulets or names or sacred prayers that were weird for this mummy. It was almost like his whole mummification was in violation of the sacred side of Egypt. For example, this mummy was not stuffed with herbs to keep the shape. And in fact, what they put on his body was like a lime formula that made the body smell horrible. It appeared that the body was wrapped very quickly, not like regular mummies that sit with salt for 35 days and then are wrapped with precision. Even though there was quite a bit of disdain for this person, again, we do know that he had to have been someone very important, important enough to be buried with pharaohs. And we know that even though, again, there was disdain for him, he obviously was a royal or some form of a nobleman because he had on gold earrings. 
At the time of this boy's death, he was no older than the age of 25. And again, we have nothing on his body to indicate that he was unhealthy or sick or even murdered. So what happened? And do we have suspects? Glad you asked. Many people might not be aware of this, but the Egyptians did practice at one point human sacrifice. There is an area in Egypt called Abydos. And 5,000 years ago, it appears that people were sacrificed with the king or the pharaoh. I guess they felt like the king, the pharaoh, needed his servants and his family in his next life. So upon his death, a bunch of other people had to die too. We know this because of their burial plots. The graves the human sacrifices were found in appear to have all been dug up at the same time. The bodies all seem to have been dropped into the graves at the same time. And given the age of some of the bodies that were found, it does not appear that any of these people died of a sickness or a natural cause. A lot of them were quite young. It does appear by the food left behind in their graves that they were, yes, indeed, sacrifices. Now, we know from archaeologists that eventually the Egyptians did stop doing human sacrifice because they started running out of their best people. I guess they realized there was no use having a civilization here on this side of the veil when all your people are getting sent to the other side of the veil before their time. So even though a lot of the archaeologists have kind of scratched off human sacrifice off the list of suspects, some archaeologists are still leaving that a possibility. Was our mystery mummy a sacrifice for one of our great pharaohs to join him in the afterlife? Is that why he has no name? Because he didn't need a name. Because when a pharaoh rose from his tomb, he'd be able to take our mystery man along with them to the next world. Our next suspect is the son of Ramses III, Pentaweer. Now, Pentaweer seems to be the most likely suspect, although I'm not so sure. Pentaweer is a fascinating character in our history, and I'm glad I stumbled upon his story. I do believe that Pentaweer himself was a victim of his mother. Yes, Pentaware was the son of Ramses III, so this would have made Pentaware a royal. However, he was the son of Ramses' second wife, Taya. Ramses III had three wives, and it had already been agreed that one of Ramses' sons with another wife would be the heir to his empire. Well, Taya, Pentaware's mother was having none of this. And so she, with some other people in Ramsey's inner circle, created what is now known as the Harem Conspiracy. You see, they were going to ambush Ramsey's and have him assassinated, forcing Pentaware on the throne. At this time, Pentaware was only about 18 years old, and it does seem that he was kind of innocent in all this, like he didn't really know what was happening. Anyway, they got caught, and of course they all got arrested. Now, again, for the Egyptians, the afterlife was really, really important. And it doesn't matter how much you didn't like a royal or someone of the royal bloodline, they still were going to have to be preserved for the afterlife. After all, the gods had ordained them ro royal, so of course they needed to maintain this royal body for their next life. Well, when they had the trial for this harem conspiracy, all of the people involved were found guilty. Now, some of the people involved who were not royals were set off to be burned alive. Now, to be burned alive meant that you had no more body to speak of. So therefore, this was a punishment worse than death because this punishment meant that you had no afterlife. Your body was gone. So for Pentaware, for his punishment, he received death as well. But 
Because he was royal, they could not burn him alive. So they allowed him to kill himself. Now we know that poison is big in Egypt. Hell, it's, it's big everywhere. And it's a very common way to murder yourself or somebody else. They had Pentaware poison himself. And this is apparent by the mummy's stomach. The mummy's stomach has absolutely nothing in it, as if he had been poisoned and threw everything up before his death. The look on his face shows someone that had been poisoned because perhaps maybe the poison stopped him from breathing. This would also explain the hastiness of the mummification, the disrespect shown to the mummification, even though Pintaware would have his body in the next life, it would not be as pristine as the other mummies coming back to life. He also had no name to go into the next life with. And worst of all, he was placed in the tomb with his father, Ramses III. So now his father, the one that he conspired against, was going to be the one responsible for pulling him into the other side. Now there have been some DNA tests done and some people say that it looks like this mummy might have been genetically related to Ramses III. However, some archaeologists say that this testing isn't 100% accurate and that might be a biased conclusion. I would accept if it was Pentaware. However, I believe that it was somebody else entirely different. A royal, yes but not a royal of Egypt. Why do I believe this? Because the mummy had blonde hair. This mummy was also about five nine, five feet, nine inches tall. And even though that's not that tall for a man today, back then that was really tall. So here we have this blonde haired, tall young boy in Egypt. Who could this have been? In the opening, I read a snippet from a letter that King Tutankhamun's widow wrote to the king of the Hittites. Again, the Hittites were located around where Turkey is located today. Now, when we think of the people of Turkey today, we don't necessarily think of Nordic looking people. However, at this point, they were pretty Nordic looking they would have definitely stood out in Egypt. Well, the king of the Hittites did respond to Tutankhamun's widow and he sent one of his sons, a son named Zaniza. It seems that since the beginning of time, marriage has been used as a political alliance. And perhaps for the king of the Hittites sending his son down to Egypt, to marry the Pharaoh's widow was a good move politically. Did this mean or did the Egyptians possibly feel like having Zanaza in their country and married to the Pharaoh's widow meant that the Hittites now owned them? It's hard to tell. All we know is Zanaza never made it over the border. He seemed to have disappeared, disappeared from our history books and from our records. However, we do know that this mummy had blonde hair and was very, very tall. This mummy was also bound. His arms and his legs were bound together. And it could be possible that if this is Zanaza, he was poisoned by some of the Egyptians he ran across coming into the country. Egyptians that didn't want their homeland sold out from under them through a marriage. If this is Zanaza, many archaeologists believe that it was the intention of the Egyptians to ship his body back to his father. They did what they could to try to honor what appeared to be the Hittite ritual of burial. However, something happened and the body was never returned and ended up sitting in a tomb with pharaohs for all these thousands of years. Frankly, I believe this probably is the Hittite prince. It just makes sense with his physical descriptions, his blonde hair, his tall height. That to me makes sense. However, I am open to it to also being Ramsey's son as well. You let me know 
who do you think this mummy is? And I thank you again for sitting through another fun Monday mystery. Again, many thanks to Josh McKay for doing our music. Once again, to purchase his opening song, you can follow the link below. And also a very special thank you again, as always to Todd Roderick for helping me put together this video and get it onto the computer and out to you guys. If you would like to follow Todd's band, The Flying Mystics, there's also a link to their band as well in the description box below. All right, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.